uh, put where you're from in the chat. And you know what, why don't we go ahead and get going? I'm going to um, ask that folks remain muted until the very end, unless of course you're reading, in which case don't remain muted. And um, I, uh, otherwise I will sort of mute you as we go along. So, um, oh, and I'm gonna be uh, admitting folks as I do this little sort of intro as well here. So um, first of all, I wanna say um, thank you for joining us. My name is Simmons Bunton. I'm the editor in chief of terrain.org. And I'm coming to, coming to you from here in Tucson, Arizona, where I respectfully acknowledge my presence on the traditional and ancestral lands of the O'odham and the Pascua Yaqui. So I want to thank our lovely readers this evening, Allison Hawthorne Deming and Suzanne S. Rancourt and Anne Haven McDonald. And of course, I want to thank you all for joining us. I know that you have lots of things to choose from. Let me just say you've made the right choice tonight, and I know we'll all agree with that by the end. Uh, I also want to thank my buddy Derek Sheffield, who is our poetry editor, who is hosting uh, this event. And as soon as I get out of the way, he'll take over. And special thanks to Sheffield Utility Sales, which may or may not be related to Derek Sheffield, uh, for their sponsorship of this evening's event. So uh, let me say that if your connection becomes slow, uh, it may speed up a little bit if you turn off your video. Otherwise, actually, it's kind of nice to keep your video on so that the readers can see you. This is not a seminar um, where you just see the reader, but you can choose to only see the reader uh, if you'd like. Otherwise, we keep it in gallery view, at least as the readers. It's kind of fun to have an actual audience. Um, okay, so we're recording this, as you've noticed, and all uh, this and all readings will be made available on the Terrain.org website as well as on the YouTube page. And just, if I may call out a little bit for our YouTube page, and I'll put a link there here in a bit, because as soon as we can get 100 subscribers, just 100 subscribers, we can actually change the name from this absurd long URL to something like youtube.com slash terrain org. And as a guy who works in the marketing and branding field, that makes all the difference in the world. Of course, the content there is pretty great too. Um, our series is held on the fourth Monday of every month. And on September 27th, I'm delighted to report that Juan Morales will be hosting readings from Joy Castro, Elizabeth Jacobson, and Alan Braden. That's gonna be a fun evening as well. Links to register for that reading will be found on terrain.org probably a little bit later tonight or tomorrow for sure. So um, hold your breath and then sign up for that. It'll be another wonderful reading. And as long as we're all on here, I'll be posting book links and links to terrain.org contributions from our readers this evening, too. Um, if you want to find their books uh, and you miss those links, you can hop over to um, uh, the terrain.org bookshop page, which is bookshop.org slash terrain.org, and find the link there. Let me admit a few more folks here. Okay. Um, so, a few things, uh, announcements, if I may, before we get started. And thanks, everyone, for telling us where you're from. I think that's so awesome. First, the deadline for the Terrain.org 12th Annual Contest in Poetry, Nonfiction, and Fiction is just around the corner. It's the end of the day on Monday, September 6th, which is Labor Day here in the U.S. We have $3,500 in prizes available, and our esteemed judges this year are Ellen Bass for Poetry, Amy Nanzuka Matal for nonfiction, and Maurice Carlos Ruffin for fiction. And you can learn more at terrain.org slash contest. Second, terrain.org is the world's first online environmental journal. And we've been publishing since 1998. We're an all volunteer organization that doesn't charge to access our content, nor charge to submit, with the exception of the aforementioned contest, I guess I should say. Uh, nor contain advertising. Indeed, we are run by the power of goodwill and dedicated weekends and evenings because we're all volunteers. And we are run by donations from good folks like you uh, who are welcome to donate online at your convenience at terrain.org slash donate. So thank you in advance for your support and for being a part of the terrain.org community. Okay, got that out of the way. Now we have finally a special announcement um, of some editorial changes. Um, first, and I think I saw that Alan is here, um, Assistant Poetry uh, Editor Alan Braden, who will be reading with us in September, um, is retiring after many wonderful years serving Terrain.org. 
Uh, let me just say, Alan, we're so fortunate to have you work with us. Um, Alan, I think, was our longest standing uh, assistant editor. So, and he's done an amazing job and really holds the bar up high for all of the other assistant editors. So, Alan, thanks so much uh, for your service. Uh, you will be missed. Um, so we are replacing Alan with not one, but two, because apparently Alan does so much work with two new assistant poetry editors. So I'm pleased to announce that Sean Ballard, the winner of our inaugural Editor's Prize in Poetry this year, and Betsy Aoki, I'm ho I hope I'm pronouncing that name right there, um, a longtime supporter of and contributor to the journal, will become assistant poetry editors. And then in nonfiction, I'm likewise delighted to announce that Sean Enfield, whose essay, Campsite on Troubled Land, will publish next week in terrain.org, um, will be joining us as the assistant nonfiction editor. So really excited about these three new editors. Um, sad to see Alan go, but thank you, Alan, for your time. And for those other editors, I'm so excited to have you join us. You'll see them up on the terrain.org masthead, as virtual as it is, um, after Labor Day. So welcome to everyone. Okay. So that's enough about uh, terrain.org and certainly enough for me. So let's turn the reading followed by Q&A um, over uh, here to Derek here in just a moment. But first, let me say, as you have questions, please post them in the chat and then we'll call on you after the reading um, to uh, ask your questions. Of course, we'll have the time and the opportunity for discussion uh, beyond that as well. But you know, as you think about it, post them in the chat. So now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's host. Derek Sheffield. Thank you, Simmons. Ah, I'm not done yet. Settle down. <laughs> Derek's collection, Not for Luck, was selected by Mark Doty for the 2019 Wheelbarrow Books Poetry Prize and published on January 1st of this year. It's a fantastic book, by the way. His other books include Through the Second Skin, also a pretty amazing book, um, finalist for the Washington State Book Award, and Dear America, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy, for which I have a certain affinity because Elizabeth Dodd and I are the co-editors of that book. And by the way, you can find Letters to America in that Dear America book from two of tonight's readers, Allison Hawthorne Deming, who I think many of you know started the entire series. So thank you, Allison, for that. Um, and Anne Haven McDonald also has a really amazing letter poem in there. So when Derek isn't teaching at Wenatchee Valley College or editing poetry for terrain.org, and, and frankly, I make him work hard at that, he can be found skiing, hiking, birding, botanizing, or forest bathing in the mountains of North Central Washington. All right, my friend, you're on now. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Simmons. And I want to join you uh, briefly here in thanking Alan Braden uh, one of my favorite poets who has, um, uh, like, as Simmons said, is one of our longest standing editors um, at terrain.org uh, until he collapsed, until we ran him into the ground, yes. And uh, so, yeah, he, he uh, uh, Alan, your, your work on behalf of terrain.org is much appreciated and we're going to miss you, um, but please don't go far. And I want to thank my father, Lonnie Sheffield, who is underwriting tonight. Um, just because we don't get paid doesn't mean our uh, readers don't have to not get paid. And, you know, really, it's not our choice not to get paid. I mean, if someone, if some, some big pockets out there ever want to say, hey, you know, we really like what you're doing and we'd like to, uh, to help you do it and, uh, and not... Um, you know, burn out uh, like Alan Braden, uh, then we would say, yeah, uh, come on aboard. We, we can take that money. So, uh, but anyway, we do try to, uh, whenever possible, we want, we pay our uh, writers and our readers when we can, uh, when we can get funding for that. And tonight's readers are being paid by my father's business, Sheffield Utility Sales. And um, Lonnie, you're now part of the literary landscape of America. Uh, Hope you, uh, you enjoy hearing that. And I think it's only fair. I grew up uh, listening to my father uh, talk about the merits of the, the electrical transformers he was representing to uh, various PUDs and other sorts of institutions. So, um, you know, the, the qualities of bushings and, uh, you know, insulated um, 
this or that of the best oil to use. And, and so here we are come full circle for all your transformative needs, Sheffield Utility Sales. So what I would like to do is introduce each of tonight's marvelous writers um, before she reads. And as Simmons mentioned, we're starting off with Annie Haven McDonald. She also goes by Anne, so it's okay if you, you call her that. Uh, she lives and she's coming to us tonight. Oh, speaking of, uh, I'm, hey, I'm coming to you from Leavenworth, Washington, which is the ancestral land of the Pascuosa tribe. So thank you very much, Annie, for reminding me about that. Uh, Annie is coming to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and she teaches as an associate professor in English and creative writing at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Her poetry has been published widely in the Georgia Review, Nimrod, uh, and elsewhere. She uh, was the winner of the fifth annual Terrain.org Poetry Prize uh, and second place uh, her poem took second place in the Ginkgo International Inco Poetry Prize. Her chapbook, Living with Wolves, was published by Split Rock Press in the fall of 2020. And uh, I happen to know that the lead wolf biologist of Yellowstone, uh, Doug Smith, read this and loved it. Her full-length manuscript is, oh, her, her full-length book is right here. Hold it. There's no book here. What's wrong? Hey, Jeff Schatz at Gray Wolf, I'm talking to you. What's wrong with this picture? This kid, she's got poems in All We Can Save. She's Her manuscript is making the, the rounds of the Great American Sweepstakes and the uh, Levis Poetry Prize, the Wheelbarrow Poetry Prize, the Hopper Prize. So listen. Gray Wolf, this could be you right here. This could be a Gray Wolf book I'm holding up. So don't wait, because that manuscript is hot. Um, Annie has been a writer in residence uh, at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest and the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. And she is also one of our poetry editors at terrain.org. Annie, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Derek, thank you so much. And thanks for that plug too. That's awesome. Um, and thank you for hosting this reading. And thank you, Simmons and everyone at terrain.org. It's such a wonderful community to be a part of. Um, thank you, Suzanne and Allison. It's such an honor to be able to read with you tonight. And I'm going to read first some poems from the chat book, Living with Wolves. And this book grew out of, I've spent, I lived on this island in British Columbia for a year and then I've gone back as much as possible and um, it's a really special place to me. And I did some research and interviews um, with people about their experiences and encounters with wolves on the island who disappeared and then made their own way, their own amazing way by swimming miles across the ocean to get back there. So. Um, it was a story that fascinated me and this series of poems comes out of that. So I'm gonna read a few from this book and then a few newer poems. Um, this poem is called The Swimmers and it has an epilogue. After all the wolves on the island were killed by cyanide traps and bullets, Decades later, wolves from the mainland swam for miles to repopulate the island. By dream, by twitch, by lope, by gazing from the shore, by howls that gather, by circle and whine, by hint, rumor, and surge, by yearn, nip, and bark, by stretch, itch, and shake, by splash, dunk, and swim, by starlight, by bull kelp and driftwood, by calm and gelatinous sea, by stink of whale, by salt of far, by winter fur, by paws as paddles, by chuff and nostril huff, by steam of breath above the sea, by belly of salmon, by hunger for deer, by memory and blood, by roam for love, by milk 
and teat, by marrow and fat, by muscle, skull, and golden eyes, by magnetic pull, by currents and tides, by miles, by sinking cold, with no one watching, by sea, by sea, by sea. And this poem is called The Songs. The house is a shell, quiet and permeable. What is the mother tongue of forest on the edge of low tide sea? We cup our ears, walls thin as skin. We sweep sawdust into corners, sit on plywood in the rising dark. Our necks bare as peeled fruit the house breathing in its bones. Who can say how many? Deep in their throats, the songs split into strands. Strange harmonics that climb from roots, my spine knows as sorrow. Loss and remembering the same churn. Howls spin into whirl, gathering whir of shorebirds, silver flash of fish, fat dark from the wells of trees. The air after, sheared, knife quiet. Hold my hand, you whisper, I hold. Um, and this one is called The Flute Player. A scream is made to cut through the mind's fog. All rescue circuits flipped on. Any kind of baby animal will do. When his sleep is sliced by sounds from the gully, deep in the woods outside, he moves towards the yawl, a flashlight tunneling into dark, searching the cry, and he knows before he sees the tawny warm fur, speckled white, folded in a thicket of salal. The fawn's mouth is open, her fresh pink tongue hanging while the cry loops itself out from her belly where her eyes wide open and hardened to whatever she sees outside are already living inside wherever this cry cuts from. What could he do? He thinks how the sound must pull all the blood in her mother hidden and waiting. The wolf must also be waiting to finish this, listening to this cry light up a tunnel of hunger. Once he played his flute across the bay and the wolves began to sing to each other across the water, stitching this island and that. Always the arc and hang of their howls, the pull inside him towards this sound that peeled the air and the silence after, the night full and undone. He thought of carrying that speckled fawn home, but left it all of it, the sound of his own footsteps through the brush, all he heard in his long walk back to the porch light he left on in his cabin with a door that doesn't lock. I'm gonna read, let's see, two more from here. This one is called The Tracker Speaks. All the newcomers, do-gooders, tree huggers like you don't know shit. Nine wolves in her yard come home to roost. Then they call me, then they buy a gun. All my life I've followed tracks in snow. I call it the white pages. I don't need to read it in books. Tracks tell me everything. I don't shoot lightly but wolves have lost their fear. Not my trap line. Back in the depression, no one had any money. We all needed deer meat. Some set out scraps dipped in poison. Now that's not right either. I don't shoot lightly. Once I trapped a wolf in Otter Cove, the others stayed away. They knew something bad happened there. Once I followed a cougar's tracks just to see what she did. A hollowed out cedar log with a crack on top. That's how cagey. 
She lay inside to watch what came up the creek. I don't need others to tell me. Wolves swam back after the beaver returned. They liked the fat. Okay, last poem from this book I wanna read is the last poem from the book called Shadow into Wolf. On the long low tide of seal spit, I studied just beyond the horizon of sight. A dark twist of driftwood, black against the sandy bank and shag of cedar. Thought, it's just like my mind to make a branch a wolf snout. Profile with two ears pricked towards our boat, where you load waterproof bags and I rest a flash. I backed away from the killdeer's broken wing dance, gave her nesting space, found this water-worn cedar log to sit a spell. And like a dream swims up to waking, I saw that branch rise and all at once become an actual black wolf, watching you load our boat thought it's just like a wolf to sit beyond the horizon of sight, to shapeshift, to yank the mind towards what it fears or yearns for. And just like a wolf to stand up full, embodied toothy fact, cut a hole in the forest, all the gathered shade and shadow, turn back to trees and leave me wondering what I saw and how I might tell it. Thank you. Um, I think I have a few more minutes. I'm just going to read a few poems. Um, a couple of poems from my manuscript and a couple of new short poems. This is a poem called, um, this poem is from that climate collection, All We Can Save, which is an amazing book if you haven't checked it out. And this poem is called, She Told Me the Earth Loves Us. She said it softly, without a need for conviction or romance. After everything, I asked, ashamed. That's not the kind of love she meant. She walked through a field of gray beetle board pine, snags branching like polished bone. I forget sometimes how trees look at me with the generosity of water. I forget all the other breath I'm breathing in. Today, I learned that trees can't sleep with our lights on, that they knit a forest in their language, their feelings. This is not a metaphor. Like seeing a face across a crowd, we are learning all the old things newly shined and numbered. I'm always looking for a place to lie down and cry. Green, mossed, shaded, or rock quiet, empty. Somewhere to hush and start over. I put on my antlers in the sun. I walk through the dark gates of the trees. Grief waters my footsteps, leaving a trail that glistens. Um, and this poem is called Love Poem for a Friend. And it has a epigraph by Ilya Kaminsky. But you could say that two people sitting at a kitchen table and talking about what matters pretty much makes up a church. That is what a church is in one way or another. The knobby spine of that Mustang holds the horizon like a hammock. Behind her swayed back, the sky burns apricot into the day and the truck emptying its tank towards Utah. <clears throat> There's the frack wells framed by the cup of that horse's spine, and soon there's the great spine of stone that runs along the river. Another November, we park side by side, pick a canyon from our perch, follow deer prints and crypto. Where the rain goes down, we go. In a room of stone, we sit and watch sunlight through the membranes of a bat's wings as she flits and darts for insects we can't see, rising off to Nahas. Two people talking can be a church, he said. And though he meant the war, we let words rise from this flood of silence. 
shake like my dog does head to tail, water spitting off, shuddering herself new. Across a fire, the only light that smears the stars, we sit in some earned peace of 50 years, telling stories of old loves and our miraculous survival. Meet me here, my dear, both of us gorgeous, leafing out lavishly in our spectrum of queer, this tangle of slick rock canyons unbuilt for us. Two people not talking can be a church too. Um, <clears throat> okay, one more poem. This one is uh, for my mom. This is a, I've been backpacking with my mom for her birthday every year. And this year she turned 80. This is a poem that comes from that, 80. This meadow was once a necklace of beaver ponds. My mother has lived long enough to remember. She walks with poles, I carry her pack. We pitch tents near a cut bank of whiskey dark creek. As night loosens and oozes up the valley, the peaks go cindery, remote. We take our plastic cups of whiskey to the open grass where dark condenses in the long stilts of a moose her dewlap dangling as she plows the meadow like a prow of a ship, like a cello solo, tipping into ban banjo twang. Browsing willows, our smell must hit her sideways and she swings her giant head, stills herself like a lake behind a dam, churning her discernment. What are we here, mother and daughter, mild and dissolved, our favorite rooms to watch from? Two calves wobble out, chasing the roof of her belly. Something human gusts out of, it, uh, out of us and the mast of her lifts and fills and sails across the grass, which has knitted itself from water, which is creeping back to forest, which is now an opening where mothers and daughters meet. Thank you. Oh. That was beautiful, Annie. Thank you so much. Um, the generosity of water. I feel that in your poems too. And I wish it, I wish it for all of us. Um, well, uh, I, I do have to say that one of those poems, I think even was ringing my bell. So that's, I've never had that happen before. There were four or five dings that happened while I was listening to a poem and I think I'm the only one who heard them. So that's amazing. And um, Jeff Schatz, just remember you had your um, chance. Okay. So, hey, uh, it's time for me to introduce Suzanne S. Rancourt, who is of Abenaki Huron descent. Her debut collection of poems, Billboard in the Clouds, won the Native Writers Circle of the America's First Book Award. Murmurs at the Gate was published in 2019 and Old Stone's New Roads was published in 2021. And Aikido and Eido practitioner, I just learned how to say that, thank you, Eido practitioner, um, I don't know what that is, but I'm a little afraid of it. Uh, Suzanne holds graduate degrees in psychology and creative writing. She is and is a multimodal expressive arts therapist. She is a United States Marine Corps and Army veteran. Uh, you can read poetry by Suzanne in terrain.org. And I do know her work a bit too from this lovely collection native voices which is the only anthology of native poetry that i know uh, that also includes essays on craft it's a really special book suzanne thank you so much for being with us tonight and adding your special voice to the evening thank you all for for attending and thank you for inviting me and i'm coming from actually the Adirondacks, Southern Adirondacks, um, which is 
uh, traditionally minded by the keepers of the eastern door of the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawk people, some Mohican ancestry also. Um, and on occasion, certain times of year, traditionally, the Abenaki were allowed to hunt in this area. But there were no permanent uh, people living in the Adirondacks, I'm told. Too cold and rattlesnakes. So I'm going to read a little bit from each of the books and the work that was um, in terrain um, is actually from a yet unpublished manuscript and we'll do that. So. Nature uh, is in us all, and it, I don't have to think much about including it in metaphor because it's how I was raised. And so it's always in my work. Thunder Beings. While gazing through a window for a split atomic second, my grandmother was struck and killed by lightning. Her left finger touching one of the four brass posters as gently as one touches the cheeks of newborns, as though she had pressed a doorbell, a button on an elevator, ascend, please. Then the lightning arced over and she crossed over, leaving a fingerprint and a strong smell of uric acid. Her name was Dorothy an artist taught by the nuns. She painted in oils the light and dark of all things, ships full sail on calm oceans. I could not reach them hanging on the wall, so I'd pull a chair under these two paintings, one new moon dark, the other full moon light. I would press my finger on each brush stroke each sail, wondering where these ships were sailing in my meme's head. Her name was Dorothy, a Parisian farm woman, I was told, who on bad days when the horse and carriage couldn't make the hard scrabble to mass, would open up the parlor and hold her own chanting Hail Marys. The next year, the lightning came back, took the barn, took the horses. The bed where my cooling meme had lain the year before was removed from the house, stored in the shed, until forty years later when I polished for days the spokes and posters, a brass lamp of sorts, illuminated images of a woman I never knew. I rubbed until the chalky thunderhead blue dissolved and the metal shone lightning yellow. For years I slept in this bed and often heard her still humming in the brass. And this next one is about my dad. And I got to read it to him, and he understood it in his own Yankee way. It was a simple, huh, that's a good sign. Whose mouth do I speak with? I can remember my father bringing home spruce gum. He worked in the woods and filled his pockets with golden chunks of pitch. For his children, he provided this special sacrament, and we'd gather at his feet, around his legs, bumping his lunch box, and his empty thermos rattled inside. Our skin would stick to Daddy's gluey clothing, and we'd smell like Mama's pine saw. We had no gum, or we had no money for store-bought gum, but that's all right. The spruce gum 
were so close to chewing amber, as though in our mouths we held the eyes of coyote. And how many other children had fathers that placed on their innocent, anxious tongues the blood of trees. These next two are from Murmurs at the Gate, and this is a true account. It may be triggering for some. It's one of the few I don't talk about blood, but it's, you know, anyway. <laughs> the viewing. By the way, I was born and raised in West Central Maine, and it was quite rural. The viewing. I want to write about you because you are still here. You were never a tall person. Your height reflected the size of woodland people, rounder now, but not in the photo as a young man pressing your back into the DeSoto's closed trunk and the heel of your boot hooked onto the curved chrome bumper, hands stuffed in slash pockets of your leather jacket, Appalachian James Dean, as a child, I noticed your hands, thick as oak roots, wide as bear paws, were like your father's. I noticed when you handled a wrench, gripped the truck steering wheel, or when you removed that petrified baby rabbit from the middle of the logging road. Both of you rounded, brown and small, crouched before the rolling dust and grill of a chugging Detroit diesel. Hoisting with your Popeye arms, you swung yourself into the truck cab. Your feet barely reached the clutch, brakes, and accelerator. I asked, why did you do that? Releasing emergency brakes with your 29-inch inseam leg, and slight grinding of gears, you said, it ain't easy being small. I didn't think of you as being small. Your gestures were always big, like the day you said, come on, Susie, Herbert's killed the bears. You pulled your height upright, charged across the lawn and headed next door. You took the shortcut through the spruce trees down the banking to the road that only us kids and dogs used. I skip-trotted to keep up. My calloused feet and stub toes kicked up paddy puffs of roadside sand. Herbert lived next door. Already a crowd had congregated to view bodies displayed side by side, belly down, noses parallel. When Herbert talked, he sucked his teeth, the sound almost as sharp as snapping gum. He'd squint his eye opposite of the corner of the mouth that leered when he sucked his teeth, as though flesh was stuck between them. Come on, Susie. Herbert's killed the bears. And we went to see our relations rendered waste by bad blood and heat to see for ourselves our family, a boar, a sow, and two cubs, the adults largest in the state, all lived behind our house on the mountain. You showed me their tracks, how they marked trees, rolled logs, where they fished. When they mated in the hollow, they screamed like women. You said they were harmless. They had their space, and we had ours. Herbert killed the bears, sucked his teeth, and told how easy it was to kill babies, how the male required more, heavier trap, shorter chain, 
more bullets. Herbert just killed. You spit a puckering spit that shook the earth when it hit just inches from Herbert's feet. Come on, Susie. We've seen enough. This next poem, I was told by a lot of academics that it was a terrible poem. Unfortunately, I believed them for about 30 years. And then I added a a different last line. You be the judge of it. Fabric. The weaver has become the pattern. Plaid. Full of angles and predictabilities and the shuttling of husbands, children, lovers. Where's her thin? There are two movements past and future. The loose swatch of the present unravels, always in ballet fashion, dangles gracefully between flying and landing. There is a texture in love that needs to be felt, needs deft fingers to braid the over-under of self. Fingers that toe dance over warp and weft, that understand the rhythm of the loom, the tapestry, an arabesque of extended tones, both subtle and vibrant. With eyes closed, the clatter of shuttle, and feet pumping the loom like a grand pipe organ resonating across threads, she remembers her last words to her first lover. Like worn denim, love me like that. How many of you remember May baskets? Yeah. May baskets. Flash of yellows flutter, old leaves scuttled by spring wind swirl, tumble across new green as a trembling of finches, ribbons around the base of beech and ash. Early morning before sun has drunk the drops of starlight dew, their celestial reflection flickers into water drop prisms. This is paradise. This is life. Sung by the instructions of bees and the buzzing cure of the hummingbird's return. My feet planted like the child I was still in the wonderment of earth's receptive body lime green grasses awaken a gentle movement of blessings sometimes i just get inspired by what ifs and a photo or a smell or something. I wanted to ask him his name. My feet pressed hot into sand. His presence quoted shadowed walls chipped by holy wars. No one needs to make decisions today, he said. Just walk. My scarab toes pushed pebbles. I wonder, does a time traveler know every journey? What do I know 
but to ask questions God wants others to hear. This bearded old man whose laughter rolls through keyhole says, we walk east toward something yet to come, pilgrimage, his hands with fingers linked behind his back, is the only moment we get, and I think, what crescent curve does the sky reveal when we pay homage to the stars? And then from the fourth manuscript, uh, Songs of Archilochus. I, I'm a wee obsessed with Greece. <laughs> I love it. Not the mainland. Islands. You got to hit the islands. And the sulfur springs that come directly out from the volcanoes. Concentric interpretation. Two ants carry the dead over rocks. Calcite viscera, connecting roots and arid plants to soil, vertical. They worked together like their race depended on it. And I feel really blessed especially after having been on the road for several weeks, actually, to come home and go to this place that this next poem is about, which is just up behind my house. It's on my land. This forest is thick with life and planted green with shadows. Dandelion seeds swarm, hover, comet along the forget-me-not Milky Way, their star blossoms, nebula around the stone altar at the lodge. Rain smells before thunder arrives, precedes wind that scatters mosquitoes, drives mayflies onto coffee cup lids, twists branches, forces leaves to belly up. Struck by reflection at how all this moves through the plane that makes it so, the as in, as above, so below. But what is that, this space, that turns into this? Forget-me-nots, spill their poured path to follow dandelions together even when dispersed incidents constellate christmas 1975 love i would rather have some than none thank you Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, I really admire how the weave of, of people and nature uh, is unbroken in your poems. And, and um, your, your poems that touched upon human love, that line, love me like that, like the worn denim, I think, um, was it Don Everly passed today? Was it the last of the Everly brothers? Um, uh, so love has been in the air all day for me. I've been hearing Everly brothers songs. Uh, and uh, so you're resonating um, with, with them and their ballads too for me. Um, thank you. Well, uh, Allison Deming, there's way too much to say about this grand manan, I mean, this grand, wonderful 
woman who is is beaming into us from Grand Manan that is slightly threatened by um, Henri. It's funny, she, uh, she sent us an email earlier today and the subject line said Henri. And I'm such a poetry geek that I thought she was sending me something from Henri Cole or something like that. You know, I'm like, oh, oh, there's a, this is a hurricane name. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Well, as, as Simmons mentioned, um, she, uh, she was the force that, that started the Letter to America series that made terrain.org evolve. Um, and our place, our sense of, of place writing changed thanks to Allison. Um, and four years later, this, this book was born. Um, so, and, and that has been one of the great joys of my writing life. I'll just say, well, life period. Uh, was editing that with Simmons Bunton and, and Elizabeth Dodd. Um, beyond that, uh, Allison is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, um, among other awards. She's a retired Regents Professor at the University of Arizona. Um, some of her marvelous books on the shelves behind me are Stairway to Heaven, Book of Poetry is the latest, and the essay collection Zoologies, on animals and the human spirit. Um, and you'll find her in many places in terrain.org, her poems, her essays, her letter to America, there's an interview. Um, and just today we published an excerpt from her brand new book. In fact, it's so new, it isn't even out yet. Last I checked, it comes out tomorrow. So it's almost like we planned this. Oh, yes, she's holding it. Look, look at Allison's screen. It's a woven world on fashion, fishermen, and the sardine dress. Um, with any luck, that title will get the attention of Tim Gunn and Heidi Klum, okay? Uh, but it's a gorgeous cover. It comes out tomorrow. And uh, really excited to see this. What an interesting book um, this, uh, this sounds like. So, um, oh, the other thing is you'll find Allison's work. There's a new, there's a really interesting publication called the Plant Human Quarterly that is being funded by the Dutch government. And this is a literary magazine that is devoted to writing, not just poetry, but writing um, that is uh, that focuses on talking and listening to plants. Annie, I'm thinking about your line about how the plant, the uh, trees can't sleep when our lights are on. <laughs> I love that. Maybe that will convince my neighbor to turn the damn lights off. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, you know the other thing is Simmons. Maybe so that so check out the Plant Human Quarterly. You'll find. I think they pretty much came up with their list from terrain.org because you'll find Robin Wall Kimmer, Kimiko Hahn, Arthur Z, Jane Hirschfield, Scott Sanders, and some other uh, marvelous people, uh, along with some work by Allison Deming. But Simmons, I think we need to talk to the Dutch government about having them fund terrain.org, okay? Because no one, uh, you know, again, yeah, goodwill. Here we are in action. Allison Deming. Please make us beautiful. <laughs> you are beautiful. I'll tell you that. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to Derek and Simmons um, and all the work you all do. Um, and Elizabeth, of course, uh, part of that central team. I um, also want to thank Suzanne and Annie. I, I you know, your works are so resonant, so powerful. Um, thank you so much. I, I loved uh, hearing you. Yes, that is a herring ware behind me. It's the Bradford Cove ware um, off the western shore of Grand Manan, an island in the Bay of Fundy off the coast of New Brunswick, Canada, where I've been coming since I was a child. Uh, I, <clears throat> um, I'm going to read the chapter that's up on terrain today. 
Um, I will just say one thing about this place since we're acknowledging um, in indigenous people um, in our places that this place was a, a place of seasonal encampment by the Passamaquoddy who came over from Pleasant Point um, and hunted for um, porpoise and um, mussels and clams and such and dried them and then um, went back home. It did not have a year round residence as far as we know of the uh, indigenous people of the region. It was settled by loyalists from the American Revolution who were exiled um, from New England and uh, settled up in uh, New Brunswick. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to read, so this chapter tonight is about the fish. If you're interested in the fashion part and the sardine dress, I just would like to direct you to um, uh, the site Literary Hub, which will be publishing the chapter about the sardine dress. And it will kind of get you into a little bit about that strand of the book. And thanks, Suzanne, for talking about weaving, because this book is a structure. It's woven, it's braided, it's, it's about family, it's about fashion, and it's about fishermen, um, particularly the traditional uh, fishery of these beautiful herring wares uh, off the shore of Grand Manan. So this is some of the ghosts. In August 2018, I took a charter flight in a single engine plane over the waters surrounding Grand Manan Island. I'd been researching the origins of the ware based herring fishery in the region for several years and finding sketchy rings of stone in offshore waters that appeared only at the year's lowest tides, hinting at the ballasted wares they once anchored. I found it hard to draw conclusions from the evidence, though it was a thrill to discover traces of a legacy that had nearly fallen from the island's memory. Many knowledgeable islanders had scoffed at the notion that undiscovered treasure lay off our shores. I'm not talking about the legend that Captain Kidd had buried gold in Money Cove on the western side of the island. Legend has it that Captain Kidd buried treasure on innumerable islands along the eastern seaboard. I'm talking about the treasure of a shared sense of place and history of ruins that are a monument to community and the dignity of work. Our flight was not exactly rigged for high tech reconnaissance. One pilot, one poet, one photographer leaning out the window, one fisherman all crammed into the Seahawk. We lifted over the island's interior bogs and spruce forest and ponds glinting with morning light, the plain lofted light as a red tail our spirits matched the brightness. Peter Cunningham, our photographer, rode shotgun beside the pilot. Peter is, like me, an island convert since childhood. His father, Robert Cunningham, a cloud physicist based at MIT, conducted fog studies on nearby Kent Island beginning in the 1930s. His work continued there for 60 years, providing evidence that industrial effluent from the Midwest was falling as, as acid rain in the Northeast. His work helped lead to the 1970 US Clean Air Act. Peter spent summers as a kid hanging out with island families and they are still among his kin. As a photographer, he apprenticed with Henri Cartier-Bresson. Peter's work bears witness to rock musicians, Bowie to Springsteen, Springsteen to Laurie Anderson, the fall of the Twin Towers, Zen practice with Peter Matheson in Japan and sitting for witness in Auschwitz. His images make him a world citizen. One obsession of his work is to document the rock and its people. Fishermen, clam diggers, dulse pickers, worshipers, toddlers, centenarians, shipbuilders and shipwreckers, quilters and bakers. He understands the island's situation as it emerges from a history wed to the sea onto the uncertain waters of climate change, which inevitably means culture change. We've clomped around some shorelines together in pursuit of stone ware ruins after the clear message of the Ring of Rock in Grand Harbor. Our minds became magnetized to objects emerging at low tides. It became easy to imagine a ruin, ruin wherever a sliver of stone peeked out of the water, looking suspiciously linear and well-placed. I say ruins, but there was something vital about the sighting, something so present and actual that the word seems wrong. The rocks that draw the shape of work once done in these waters are a cultural heritage. To see them, record them, are acts of preservation, to hold them in photograph or writing, 
is to participate emotionally with place and community. J.B. Jackson writes in The Necessity for Ruins that a traditional monument is an object which is supposed to remind us of something important. That is to say, it exists to put people in mind of some obligation that they have incurred, a great public figure, a great public event, a great public declaration which the group had pledged itself to honor. That can backfire. Saddam Hussein's statue is toppled and everyone cheers. General Robert E. Lee is toppled and ghosts of the Confederacy send up smoke signals of rancor and hatred. Pledging oneself to the wrong side of history is poison. A monument to the 17th century British slave trader, Edward Colston was recently toppled and dumped into Bristol Harbor as Black Lives Matter protesters acted to detoxify their environment. But ruins marking the labor of forgotten makers the millions whose hands crafted civilizations can be monuments worth honoring. Jackson writes, many of us know the joy and excitement, not so much of creating the new as of redeeming what has been neglected. Russell Ingalls and his family have been fishing these waters for four or five generations. Their Pat's Cove ware has been dressed with twine each summer for a hundred years. He works all the local fisheries from herring ware to lobster trap, trap scalloping to sea egg dragging. I've learned a great deal from him and appreciate his generosity in sharing his knowledge. I admire this kind of knowledge, one through work and careful observation over a lifetime. Russell is a pious and thoughtful man. He speaks with a sparkle of island wit, a judicious coping mechanism on an island of 2,500 souls where no one escapes another's scrutiny. I ask how the herring season has been and he shakes his head in discouragement and lights up with a smile, just enough to feed the seals. I was tasked with holding open Peter's window so he could lean out and focus his lens on the tidal flats in Cow Passage, that shallow reach that separates Cheney's and Whitehead Islands. I reached over his shoulder with a metal pole we'd find be found behind our seats, something like a long handled engine crank. I braced the pole against my knees to gain the proper angle. It was an awkward manner. Russell was leaning into me to catch shots out the window over my shoulder. No one cared how awkward it got because we were on a mission. My cap flew off as soon as the window opened, hair blowing wild as rockweed in a high tide surge. How'd your pictures come out? I later asked Russell. Pretty good, except your hair's in most of them. Our pilot was Peter Sonnenberg, a young man his father had launched Atlantic Charters, the flight service connecting island to mainland with air ambulance and charter flight services. Peter's father had died a few years earlier in a plane crash just shy of the island's runway. He was returning from a hospital run to St. John late in the middle of a foggy night. Russell, as first responder and fireman, had been first to arrive at the crash. It could not have been an easy thing for him to board a small plane in the aftermath of that crash, to fly right over the ground where two people he'd known for decades had died. Stories were still percolating about how things had gone wrong. An intimacy with death fuels a small community. The island is 55 square miles of rock, balsam fir, black spruce, and collective memory <clears throat> as keen as a spotting scope. Islanders know their landscape as marked by those of their own who have died, when and how. Islanders carry the spirits of the dead in story. No death is anonymous in such a place. Every death is a shared lamentation and cause to bind more closely together with the living. It's as if those who have gone before us into the long night are still watching us and we are watching them. The line between living and dying can seem fragile. How can it be that one day I'm sitting on my deck listening to the nonagenarian Gleason Green recite Robert Service poems after he laments that there used to be a bumblebee on every single blossom of clover, and the next day I'm hearing that when he got home he felt a little funny and stroked out. And yet islanders work the sea, commercial fishing, the highest risk occupation surviving frigid plunges and ferocious swells, grounding out on ledges and taking on rogue waves. The line between living and dying seems both a permeable membrane and a fiercely defended border. Some Islanders believe in the afterlife. I don't know how many really think 
that our lost ones are up there in heaven. There's a lot of heaven talk. But my guess is that anyone who has lived very long in this place feels that the lost ones are still among us or looking down on us, as people say, as if the dead were a mere thousand feet overhead. Memories become monuments in the landscape of a shared imaginary. We flew low out from the island's shore, scanning the tapestry of greens and browns that stitch the intertidal waters. Islands lose their edge with the tide. Seen at the ebb, the rocky shore gives way to a long reach of musky yellow dressed in rack. Is the moon pulling water away from us to the other side of the world? I find it so hard to imagine the planetary forces at play. Though I watch the tides come and go, come and go, and I gauge my day by their tempo. The water is always in motion, always responding to invisible power, becoming powerful itself, becoming lax. The shallows shine, the depths resist light, hoard their darkness. Shoals and ledges, brackish brown, break through here and there. Nature is messy. There are no straight lines, no perfect curves. Deep water morphs, gray blue, shallow water glows pale lichen green. When we popped up to a thousand foot altitude, forms began to resolve among the rock protrusions. The Seahawk tilted to catch the view. Patterns emerged, circles, arcs, and bars of stone set in place more orderly than the sea could accomplish on its own. A huge circle broken with a broad mouth, two long straight wings of stone stretching out symmetrically from the mouth, an invitation to schools of herring, stemming the tide up the channel, another hint of structure, then another, some legible, some largely erased. The ghost wares butted up against each other, overlapped one laid on top of the other as they were built over time. Stone ballast is all that remains of the structures once lined with brush that served as nets. The herring harvested buckets and pails and dories, men and oxen working in teams, a crazy quilt assembled by generations that have gone before. My head was spinning as the plane circled and circled. Someone would say, what's that over there? Is that another one? And we would fly to the ruin, astounded by the abundance and craft. They're everywhere, someone would say. And then someone else would repeat it. We couldn't believe our eyes. Russell's eyes must have seen more than mine. His grandfather perhaps was among the builders. These structures may have been in play as recently as the 1930s. The knowledge of sea and tides, herring and mackerel, the ability to read sky and wind patterns legible to those who work the sea, blow southwest every afternoon about 3.30, a neighbor will say, all carried from grandfather to father to son to grandson. This is a bounty that gives weight and meaning to life, makes it possible to endure our losses because people have shared what they know across generations have built ways of living that make sense in their place and time. Of course, there are new tools and new skills, radar and sonar, fish finders and diesel generators to drive wear sticks into deeper offshore waters. There are saners that chase shoals of herring out in ever deeper waters. There is our immense appetite that cannot quit its hunt for and decimation of bounty. But the ghost wares speak of small scale industry perfectly suited to its time and place. The beauty of the structure says that the builders were masterful makers with complex skill who knew something profound in their bones about the relationship between form and function. The structures hold mystery. How deep is the learning that flowed into the craft of the wares? Perhaps they speak of cross-cultural learning. Passamaquoddy people used wares in coves and streams for several thousand years before Europeans settled in the region. During the American Revolution, 30,000 loyalists flooded the Fundy region. While the violence of that time inflicted deep wounds and loss, in the quieter recesses of a new cultural mixing, knowledge was exchanged about how to make a life within the terms that nature set in that place. Makers told their stories of harvest and hardship. Stories became adaptations. Adaptations became who we are today with ever more profound lessons to learn about the terms nature sets upon our lives. We flew on from Cow Passage to circumnavigate all the wares built that season, circling and dipping a wing and repeating their names, 
Mumps, Pat's Cove, Bradford Cove, Sea Dream, Jeff Foster's Ware just going up in the pond at Dark Harbor, Money Cove, Wayne Green's Experimental Ware, Whale Cove, Intruder, Iron Lady named for Margaret Thatcher, Cora Bell, Blackened, <clears throat> Stakes Tracing, the remains of Ware is abandoned but still known by name, Jubilee, Turnip Patch. No one knows the future of the maritime herring fishery. The summer of our Seahawk flight was surprisingly abundant and led to renewed enthusiasm for ware builders. Herring showed up in wares in July and kept coming well into the autumn. The first hauls were a pleasant surprise after nearly a decade of poor harvests. As they continued, one could feel people relaxing again into the feeling of natural bounty that had shaped the island culture. For the, but for the Gulf of Maine, just south of our Bay of Fundy, the herring season was a bust. The Gulf's water had been five degrees Fahrenheit above average, above normal, I wanted to say, as if the sea had a fever. Both prey and predator had come north for the colder waters they prefer. Atlantic herring are one of the most abundant fish in the world. A shoal of herring might hold a billion fish. The weight of the eggs they spawn along the coast of Norway is three times greater than the weight of the Norwegian human population. Leif Anderson, professor of Uppsala University in Sweden, who specializes in genome biology, has led a study of herring that included sequencing Atlantic and Baltic herring. These fish are, he reports, a near ideal model to study genes underlying ecological adaptation. Atlantic herring are highly adaptable because their population is enormous and they can spawn in a range of seasons, some in autumn, some in spring. Baltic herring adapt to high levels of salinity. The Atlantic herring has a toolbox of gene variants that underlies its ability to adapt to its environment, the research team reports. I am convinced, Anderson continues, that further research on this collection of genes associated with ecological adaptation will lead to new basic knowledge about gene functions that will be relevant also for human medicine, since the majority of genes in herring are also found in humans and are expected to have similar functions. Herring, it turns out, are storytellers that have a lot to teach us about adaptation to climate change. Ruins, too, can become storytellers. Sometimes they become repurposed in unexpected ways. A friend who spends his summers in southeast Alaska, knowing of my interest in ware fishing, recounted the story of a stone ware made for catching salmon built along the western coast of Canada. In high tides, the salmon entered. In low tides, the fish were stranded. The weir had been built and fished by Haida people, though at least a hundred years had passed since they had lived in that place. But the weir was still fishing, said my friend. Brown bears use it, splashing out at low tide to feast, leaving salmon carcasses all around their kitchen. We do not have bears on Grand Manan Island. We no longer have many wild salmon, but we have a culture schooled by relationship with the sea. And that is a way of belonging to the world worth cherishing. Hmm. Oh, that was lovely, Allison. Thank you so much. Um, how I love how you um, interrogate and explore the word ruin, how it doesn't quite feel right for what those are. And I think many of us perked up when you talked about memories as monuments. And mm -hmm. I was reminded about something I read. Um, Bill McKibben said about your work once that you, that Alison Deming knows um, as much about the world as anyone. And, you know, thank, thank the stars she's willing to, to share that wisdom. And I feel rich in the wisdom that you have shared with us tonight. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. I, I'm that comment by Bill McKibben totally freaked me out. I'm I'm trying to learn about the world. That's why I write. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm filled with knowledge. I feel like I need more knowledge all the time. <laughs> you know, uh, that's wisely said, Allison. <laughs> so hey, do you all have any uh, questions here? Uh, we've we've run a little bit longer than our program, but that's okay. Um, because, um, you know, we're, we're together. And um, 
and that's like a church according to Annie's great poem, right? Um, even if we don't say anything. So, um, hmm, I'm looking at the chat here. Sim Dog, did you see any uh, questiones from our listeners tonight? No, you know, just the one general question that was just posed, which is, um, let's see, by Alexis, um, Alexis Mills. Alexis, do you want to repeat that? Do you want the authors to respond to that question? Yes, no, maybe. Well, the question is, I wonder why so many people don't feel a connection to the natural world. So do I. I think sometimes it's sometimes it's cultural and culture can it can be more than race culture isn't just color culture is environment so um sometimes it's how we're raised or how we're not raised um i think for me the important question is what can we do to get reconnected? Um, and what we're doing right now is part of that. That's why I'm such an advocate for keep writing, keep speaking, keep connecting, uh, because there isn't anything, there's no wrong. Um, if you go, no matter where you live, you could be in a concrete jungle. There's nature there. Everything came from the earth. And so, you know, we're, we're taught to disconnect. I'm not out in the wilderness because I live in concrete. Where did the concrete come from? Where did the steel come from? Where did this come from? Where did that come from? You know, gravity is still happening. So what does that feel like? That's my thought. I see Allison nodding her head. Allison, jump in. <laughs> Well, I, I think the, the cultural answer is really an important one, you know, also um, how we define nature, you know, there's a there's a there's a story uh, about uh, uh, <laughs> Gary Snyder being at a writing conference somewhere in California many years ago and there was this panel about oh nature's over there's no more nature and everybody was getting all apocalyptic and there's no such thing as nature. you know they were going down that highway and snyder i wasn't there but this is a story i've heard a million times but snyder's getting more and more grumpy and restless and sitting in his chair and finally he throws up in his hand and he says if you think there's no nature left what do you make of the contents of your stomach <laughs> So, you know, the whole microbiome of our bodies, we are so embedded in the natural world in so many ways, but, you know, our culture often educates us to uh, sentimentalize culture, to be separate from culture and to live, you know, in a very abstracted relationship from the natural world. So I, I think writers and artists, I thank them all the time for um, renewing that sense of intimacy. Um, Thank you. Annie, did you have anything to add to that topic? Mm, uh, no, maybe just that um, I think it's getting harder and harder to feel separate from nature with um, climate change. And it's a reminder of um, the, the limits and the systems that we're nested in. So. Mm. Thank you. Um, so a couple more questions came in here that are aimed at you, Allison. Um, one is from, I'll just uh, give them both to you. One is from uh, Janice Ray, uh, Cracker Ecology Childhood, love that title. Will Allison talk a little about the fashion part of the new book? And then Scott Edward Anderson, um, who Suzanne, his, he's got a book coming out and it's full of Greek, illusions, it's there's Greekness everywhere. So you can geek on that Greek, uh, Wine Dark Sea. Uh, and Scott is asking, what was it like to not be able to go back to your island for so long um, because of the uh, border 
um, van or, um, you know, the, the, what do you call it? I'm tired. Pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's heartbreaking, you know, and um, obviously I, um, I'm a person of privilege that I have this place and my parents bought it in 1956. It was a little rundown fishing shack and I've improved it over the years, but um, you know, it, this is my seasonal pattern. I'm like a migratory bird and I, I have a very strong sense of community here. And, you know, I put in a lot of time in the gardens, all, everything about it was a big, big loss, but uh, also this was the safest place in North America, and I was happy not to come up here with my American cooties. So, you know, I don't have any cooties, and I'm here now. But it was it was terrible um, not to be able to come here. Grievous. I'll just I try to speak quickly about the fashion part. So, where this book started is a kind of a funny story. It's in the it's in the acknowledgments of the book, but. Um, so I wanted to write about my grandmother and great grandmother. My grandmother lived with us on my maternal side uh, throughout my childhood. And she, you know, she was just an old woman. You know, when you're growing up in the old woman in the house, your grandmother. And I loved her and, and she had all of these marvelous qualities. But I never fully appreciated the fact that she and before her, her mother had run a couture dressmaking business first the the grandmother in Paris and then in New York. So from the 18 about 18 late 1860s until the depression, these two women ran a business. It wasn't a sweatshop. There were about 14 women who worked for them. Um, and they made you know high fashion dresses during the Gilded Age for the wealthy people of New York. And a highly skilled, entrepreneurial, accomplished women. No record of this anywhere, no memory of it in our family, no stories about it. And I was aggrieved because I thought, look at the craftsmanship of these women and they should have their stories told. They should not be invisible to history. I, and so I was talking to a writer friend, Barbara Hurd, about wanting to write about them. And I, she was up here visiting me and we were walking past the abandoned smoke sheds in the community of Seal Cove on Graham and Ann. And um, she was saying, oh, you should write about this. You know so much about the fishery up here. I said, yeah, yeah, but I'm really interested in these women. Oh, she said, it's the same story. And I looked at her and it was like a dare. You know, can I talk about these two forms of craftsmanship, um, beautiful ways of life, perfectly fitted to their time and place that are threatened by all the forces that we're too well aware of? Um, and, and, and that became the challenge of the book. Um, so every third chapter is a chapter about um, a dress and every third chapter is a chapter about these women's lives and every third chapter is a chapter about the herring fishery up here. Mm. Um, well, thank you so much. As I was listening to you read your passage tonight, I was thinking I'm a big fan of Annie Prue's The Shipping News. And I'm one, I was like, this feels like there's a little bit of shipping news in this book, and I can't wait to uh, wade wade into the rest of it. In terms of the uh, those beautiful people that you are bringing to life, uh, already. Well, um, let's see here. Yeah, we've just got some more. Uh, American cooties. We've just got some more laudatory comments here. Well, folks, um, listen, I think uh, we've kept you long enough here. Uh, it's been a lovely evening. I want to thank you all for joining us, um, all of our listeners tonight, our readers, and um, wishing you well on this auspicious day when uh, we've got FDA approval for our vaccine, Pfizer, go baby, let's get us over. Yes, um, and other things like that. Suzanne, uh, uh, Simmons, do you want to, uh, do you want to say anything more, big guy? Yeah, you bet, thanks Derek. Um, and thanks of course to Ann and Suzanne and Allison. So wonderful to hear you all read this evening. And thanks for, to everybody else for coming out. It's just so great to see everyone here, even though we're not necessarily in person. We really are in person, in spirit, if that makes sense. So, you know, have a wonderful week, and thanks again for joining us, and I hope to see you on September 27th as well. Good night.